Welcome everyone to the first presentation of the 2020 Applied Linguistics Intersection webinar series. Um, I'm very excited to have Dr. Kate Seltzer as our very first speaker for the series. Um, the reason why I chose this topic of translanguaging as the theme for the entire series is because as teachers, as teacher trainers, as researchers, um, I really feel that we need to embrace the multilingual and uh, multicultural realities of our classrooms. And what excites me about Dr. Seltzer is that her research interests are rooted in her early career experiences as a high school English teacher of emergent bilinguals in New York City. So she's currently an assistant professor at Rowan University. Her research centers on expanding traditionally English medium spaces to include the diverse language practices of all students, those viewed as bi and multilingual and those viewed as monolingual. Uh, she is co-author of two books that anyone in the translanguaging space would own or would have probably read or have heard, The Translanguaging Classroom, Leveraging Student Bilingualism for Learning, and Translanguaging, A Guide for Educators. Uh, in addition, her work has been published in several edited volumes and journals such as TUSL Quarterly, Research in the Teaching of English, English Education, and Language Identity and Education. So we are indeed very fortunate to hear and learn from her today. And so I will now turn the floor over to Dr. Kate Seltzer. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, um, Anna. I really appreciate the intro. Hi, everyone. Um, so exciting to see so many people from so many different areas of the world. Um, I hope some of you aren't getting up too early or staying up too late. Um, I'm here in New Jersey, uh, where it is uh, just about 11 a.m. and I'm so excited to be here with you. So I will jump right in and share my screen. All right. As Anna said in her introduction, uh, the, the title of my webinar today is The Translanguaging Practices of Emergent Bilinguals, Leveraging Bi and Multilingual Students' Linguistic Gifts and Translingual Sensibilities. Uh, and to get us started, I am going to uh, toggle over in a second to TikTok and show you a, a video entitled, Tell Me You're Bilingual Without Telling Me You're Bilingual. So let me go over to that. No computer. Tell, Oops. Tell me you're bilingual without telling me you're bilingual. What's in? Oh, I'll go first. Come on, you search the trash, and hold the end to lie what you deleted, but like you got your fingers tapped. So much tap, 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 tap. Oh, press, press. Like, no, wait. Oh. Then you recover. Just so you say. You don't know what I know. Computer. I know you. I know you know computer. Tell me you're bilingual. Okay. So let me go back here. So, okay, what, what, what do we see uh, in this TikTok video? It's short, but there's so much here. So certainly first we, we see translanguaging, which I'm going to talk about a lot more, but refers to the fluid interrelated language practices of bilingual people. And if you follow the hashtag um, bilingual on TikTok, um, as I do, you'll see video after video uh, that feature not just translanguaging, but young people's translingual multimodal composing practices. Um, and here that means like their video making, their editing, um, and all of that composition emerges from and showcases what I've called their translingual sensibilities. And by this, I mean, among other things, their dispositions toward language, their sophisticated understandings of the role of language in our society, the intersections of language and power, and an orientation that embraces a transgression or even a rejection of monolingual norms. And, and right here, you know, just looking at some of the comments on the TikTok video that I screenshotted here, um, you can see these sensibilities at work right here in, in the first and the third 
comments, we see an interest in language sharing, right? This person says, this is a lot like explaining things to Hispanic moms, right? And the, the author said, a universal type of panic. Um, and in the, the fourth, the second and the fourth, there's this interest in language play. I mix up words between Japanese, Mandarin, and Korean all the time. Then I'd explain words I don't know in either English or Tagalog, taglish, or this last person saying a verb in my language and adding ing at the end. Um, so there's a lot of humor, there's a lot of this interest in, in language exploration and language play. And then here in this, in this third comment here, you'll see a questioning of the very things that we decide are quote normal about language, right? This person says, genuine question, so why is it such a huge flex to speak two language? isn't, languages? Isn't that like normal? Right, so again, here I would argue both translanguaging and translingual sensibilities that exist for so many bilingual people. And yet, <laughs> how do we typically teach language in schools, right? We teach that the normative ways of teaching language in schools are, they rarely tap into the translanguaging practices, translingual sensibilities and sociolinguistic gifts that students bring with them every day and are all over social media platforms like TikTok, right? Instead, the normative way of teaching language is to focus exclusively on English, right? Maybe using students' home languages as scaffolds or to briefly clarify a concept, or we separate students' languages into the, you know, quote, languages of the day uh, in many bilingual programs with very little room for students to explore the intersections of their languages and cultures and uniquely translingual, transnational border crossing lives. Um, and much of the reason that schools are set up this way is because of deep-seated ideologies that erase the norm of buy-in multilingualism and translanguaging and instead position monolingualism and quote native speakers as the ideal. So in this talk, I'm going to invite you to think about what it might look like to reorganize TESOL classrooms so that they leverage the translanguaging and translingual sensibilities of students. What ingenuity might arise? What opportunity for critical sociolinguistic conversation? What ideas for writing and creating? And what opportunities to build the kind of language practices and critical consciousness that will find them success in school and beyond? So in this first section of my talk, I'm going to talk a bit about a shift in perspective um, that is ushered in by the concept of translanguaging. And what it ushers in is this asset-based framing of bilingualism and bilingual students. Um, so to jump in, I'm going to switch us over from TikTok to Twitter and show you a video that I think provides a, a nice entry point uh, into, into this conversation. Ahora, ¿qué estás haciendo? ¿Qué? Bájate de ahí. Vete, I'll wash my face. ¿Qué? I'll wash my face. You're going to wash your face? Yeah, I'm dirty. No, quite dirty. You're not dirty. Get out of there. Okay. Bájate de ahí. Okay, I'm dirty. Okay. You're dirty? Okay. ¿Anda cochina? Sí, mira. Ay, pinche muchacha cochina. Bájate de ahí. No. Samantha. Yo quiero wash my face. Watch it to the face. Get out of there. Okay, then I'll be the face. It's to me. No. ¿Qué tienes? A ver, ¿qué tienes? Mentirosa. Bájate ahí. No. Bájate. No. Que te bajes, te estoy diciendo. No, I'll wash my face. No me estés gritando, Samantha. I'll wash my face. No me estés gritando. Okay, so, so let me go back over here. Uh, I love this video. Um, and, and one of the reasons I love it is, is, of course, it's very funny. Of course, it shows this uh, amazing, strong-willed toddler, right, doing what all toddlers want to do, trying to be her own person, trying to do what she wants, um, and of course, convincing her caregiver that what she wants to do is what she should be doing. Um, but it's also such a great example of how 
Samantha's way of languaging is the communicative norm in bilingual families. Um, how Samantha is expressing her full linguistic repertoire in this interaction with her caregiver. And it's a demonstration of how someone like Samantha can communicate very effectively through this fluid use of languaging. Um, and so you can see, you know, th this interaction of all these things, but Samantha and students like Samantha are often viewed very differently when they actually walk into schools speaking like this. Um, so how might Samantha be viewed if she were to speak like this um, to her pre-K teacher, for example, on her first day of school? What might their misperceptions of Samantha be? So her teachers might hear her way of speaking and think, well, Samantha has an incomplete knowledge of English and Spanish. Um, they might say her caregivers mixing or code switching fails to provide her with appropriate linguistic input in either language. And thus her schooling must focus on teaching her academic English or academic Spanish if she is to meet grade level expectations, right? Perhaps these are the kinds of things you've heard said about students that you've worked with. So I'm gonna talk a bit about what causes these misperceptions. What's, where they come from, what's at their root. Um, and I'm going to do that by talking about two perspectives on language. The first, which um, Ricardo Otegi, Ofelia Garcia, and Wallace Reed um, call an outsider perspective, is one that takes languages, particularly what they call named languages, as a starting point when thinking about language. The other perception, um, which perspective, which they call the insider perspective or a translanguaging perspective, takes speakers and languaging, which doesn't always align with the expectations of named standard language norms, as the starting point for thinking about language and importantly for thinking about educating bilingual students. Um, and I'm going to argue that this insider translanguaging perspective can help us to break down rather than uphold these kinds of misperceptions about students like Samantha. So let's jump into these um, perspectives. The outsider perspective sees Samantha as speaking two separate named languages, English and Spanish. One of these would be her L1, the other would be her L2. And in her interaction with her caregiver, she's switching back and forth between them. Um, this perspective upon her entry into school might view her normative way of communicating at home as inherently different from and even inappropriate for what will be expected of her when it comes to school-based language and literacy tasks, which are typically only in one named language or the other. But this insider perspective, the translanguaging perspective, views Samantha as the norm in our globalized world. A simultaneous bilingual who grew up not necessarily knowing an L1 or an L2, um, but only the ways that her family spoke to her and how she communicated back to them through the use of her integrated holistic linguistic repertoire. Some features of that repertoire sound like what is socially recognized as the named language of English or Spanish, and as Samantha gets older and goes to school, she'll learn that in certain contexts, she'll enact some of those features, but not others, depending on the communicative context. But at home, with her caretakers, in her community, she doesn't have to suppress any features. She can translanguage in ways that align with the communicative norm of her home and her community. So, so why do these framings of language matter, right? I would say that these different framings often lead to different perceptions of language minoritized speakers, right? So because an outsider perspective frames named languages as the reality, it also brings with it concepts like a quote, standard version of a language. This means that there are quote, non-standard ways of speaking that language, which in turn ushers in concepts like native versus non-native speakers, academic versus non-academic language. And an insider perspective on the other hand, 
frames all languaging as social practice, right? This innate human capacity that we all have to do and be through languaging, right? No language is inherently academic. It is how we do language, right? That would make it appropriate for a different context or another. And if bounded named languages have a standard version and a non-standard version, um, if there are native and non-native speakers, that outsider perspective also invites marginalization and minoritization of certain speakers. Usually those minoritized language users ways of languaging, right, and otherwise minoritized identities in dominant cultures differ from how named languages are defined and delineated and are thus seen as less than, um, and those speakers are perceived as deficient. An insider perspective recognizes the history of colonialism and racism in the invention of what we call named languages and understands that vestiges of that oppression persist and endure in our current educational system. So um, related to these different perspectives, um, Ophelia Garcia laid out in 2014, uh, and then she and I actually revisited this, uh, this idea in, in a 2020 article um, book chapter that we wrote together in the book Envisioning TESOL Through a Translanguaging Lens, which I would um, encourage you to check out. Um, we write that translanguage, translanguage TESOL challenges five major misconstructions about English, its speakers, the learning of English, bilingualism, and the teaching of English. And those five misconstructions um, and how we remediate them, right, is that English is not a system of structures. Native English speakers are neither the norm nor objective fact. Learning English does not proceed from scratch, is not linear, and does not result in English monolingualism. Bilinguals are not simply speakers of a first and a second language, and the teaching of English cannot be enacted in total separation from other language practices. So um, back in 14, when Ophelia wrote that a translanguage TESOL, quote, holds the promise of developing the English practices of emergent bilinguals that would enable them to be successful in academic tasks while supporting a social justice agenda that holds emergent bilinguals as knowers, thinkers, and imaginative meaning makers. And to, to do this, to, to, to envision a translanguage TESOL requires a fundamental shift in how we teach what we've come to call English in TESOL settings. Right, so instead of teaching that named language of English, a translanguaging lens on teaching English means inviting bi and multilingual students into new ways of languaging that relate to their identities, goals, beliefs, and relationships. It means leveraging the languaging and meaning making that bi and multilingual students are already doing in order to add new features and understandings to their repertoire. And it means disrupting ideologies that frame bi and multilingual students through lenses of remediation, lack, deficit, loss, and failure. And from that insider perspective, from this translanguaging lens on English, arises this definition of translanguaging, which we cite in uh, our book, The Translanguaging Classroom, which I wrote with Ophelia Garcia and Susana Ibarra Johnson, uh, that translanguaging can be understood on two different levels. From a sociolinguistic perspective, it describes the fluid language practices of bilingual communities. And from a pedagogical perspective, it describes an approach whereby teachers build bridges from these language practices and the language practices desired in formal school settings. And in the book, we, we talk about translanguaging through this metaphor, this image of a corriente or a current in a, in a river or another body of water. And in the book, we say that this corriente refers to the diverse fluid language and cultural practices that flow through classrooms, even when invisible. And um, the characteristics of the translanguaging corriente in a particular classroom of course, reflect the language repertoires of the bilingual students and the teachers. And we argue that taking up and incorporating a translanguaging perspective in the classroom means going with the flow of this corriente and bringing it closer to the surface. And um, in the book, we, we talk about the why 
right? Why go with the flow of the corriente? Why take up a translanguaging perspective um, with bilingual students and particularly with emergent bilingual students? And to do that, we, we lay out four interrelated purposes. Translanguaging helps support students as they engage with and comprehend complex content and texts. It provides an opportunity for students to develop linguistic practices for academic contexts. It makes space for students' bilingualism and bilingual ways of knowing. And it supports um, bilingual students' socio-emotional development and bilingual identities. So in the book, we talk about how taking up this perspective can be turned into translanguaging pedagogy, which is a way of bringing students translanguaging and translingual sensibilities to the surface. Um, so now that I've given you some theoretical background on translanguaging and why we believe that it's integral to educating emergent bilinguals, the rest of the presentation today will walk through the how, um, introducing this translanguaging pedagogy and some examples of that pedagogy in action in TESOL and other English learning spaces. So here um, are what in the book we call the three strands of a translanguaging pedagogy. And you'll notice from the, from the image here, these three strands get braided together, interconnected to make this supportive pedagogy. So a translanguaging stance is the philosophical, ideological belief system that teachers draw from to develop their pedagogical framework. And um, everyone's stance will, of course, be different, but there are some non-negotiables to this stance that we talk about in the book. For example, the belief that students' language practices are intertwined, not separated, that students' families and communities are integral to students' education, and that teachers are co-learners with their students. Uh, moving into the second strand of translanguaging design, emerges out of a teacher's translanguaging stance, right? So because of what they believe, teachers create instruction and design curriculum that help them to manifest those beliefs in their practice. So when we talk about a translanguaging design, we refer to a flexible design that intentionally connects bilingual students' home and community language practices and identities to the language practices and identities deemed appropriate for school settings. And this design is clearly articulated in the physical space of the classroom, the instructional design, and the way that we design assessments for our students. And lastly, like a design, a teacher's translanguaging shifts, or those unplanned moment by moment decisions that teachers make in response to the flow of the translanguaging corriente in the classroom, emerge out of that stance and are enabled by a flexible design. Taken together, um, a translanguaging pedagogy works to make visible the translanguaging corriente and then leverages it for learning. And in addition to learning that aligns with the kind of language that schools expect bilingual students to do, a translanguaging perspective can also bring to the surface students existing linguistic and sociolinguistic expertise. This elevates the TESOL classroom, right? It transcends calls for so-called academic language and creates opportunities for students to read, write, make, create, and enact their powerful translingual sensibilities and literacies. So to show you a translanguaging pedagogy in action, um, I'm first going to show you a video from the CUNY New York State Initiative on Emergent Bilinguals um, web series. Uh, the CUNY NICIB project is one that I, I worked for for a long time um, that was started and, and evolved through Ofelia Garcia's work. Um, and the name of this web series is Teaching Bilinguals Even If You're Not One. Um, so I'll show you that video first and then I'll show you a few additional examples of a translanguaging pedagogy at work in English medium spaces. And um, as we watch this clip, um, which features Shireen Chapman Santiago, who's an English language arts teacher in Brooklyn, New York, uh, who worked with the CUNY NICIB project, um, I want you to really think about where you see evidence of this teacher's stance, design, and shifts. And I'll, I'll sort of give some ideas afterwards, but have these concepts in your mind while you are watching this short video. 
So let me go over there. Currently, we're reading To Kill a Mockingbird, which is one of my favorite books. And I think it's a great book to teach this population of students. And one of my favorite quotes from this book is that uh, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb in his skin and walk around in it. And I think that's what it's all about. I think it's a middle school teacher. It's all about empathy. Welcome back to Teaching Bilinguals, even if you're not one. I'm Sarah Vogel, a research assistant with the CUNY New York State Initiative on Emergent Bilinguals. Today, I'm here at Ebbets Field Middle School, an exceptionally diverse school in Brooklyn, New York. On any given day, you can hear students speaking Haitian Creole, English, Spanish, Arabic, and two dialects of Fulani. Ms. Shireen Chapman Santiago is an eighth grade English teacher here. And she truly lives by that philosophy from To Kill a Mockingbird, that you have to know students well in order to teach them. But how can you truly crawl into your students' skin if you don't share their language practices? In this episode, we're going to find out how she does it. I think the quote really inspires me to dive deep and understand who the student is and not just, you know, a name on a roster, but who is that person and build a relationship. Let's get into Ms. Chapman Santiago's tips for building relationships with her bilingual students. Tip one, Ms. Chapman Santiago is a keen observer of her students' expressions and behavior. First and foremost, cues, body language. When you give them something and they're just like, they delve into it or they kind of just like look around. So that's, I always look at those things. I think I'm a mother first, right? So I'm very in tune to their emotions because they are teenagers and they're very dramatic. And so when they come in with that face, I'm not going to continue with the lesson. I'll direct the students to do something and I'll pull them out in the hall and have a conversation. If we don't speak the same language, I'll pull out my phone, I'll type the question, give it to them, they'll respond. And I've literally had conversations like that and uncovered some really deep and personal things that actually helped me um, deal with the students accordingly. Tip two, when it comes to academics, Ms. Chapman Santiago provides opportunities for students to show what they know using home language practices. That way, she can see their strengths and their challenges. The starting points vary from child to child. So even if you have three kids from Yemen, one may have had like some um, very advanced education, some may not because they're from the rural part. Those that are more proficient have an easier time making the transition from from their language to English, while those maybe with uh, formally interrupted education may need more interventions. I don't know the languages of the room, but I look at their work and I can infer where they are and modify accordingly. If I gave her the prompt in Arabic and she only wrote two lines, and I start wondering, is she proficient in Arabic? And then I'll compare it to her, her counterpart, we'll have a full page. And then I'm like, hmm, you know, maybe I'll need to give her a little sentence starter or a little bit more background. In the beginning of the year, January, she started out with just two lines. And then what do we see kind of later in the year with your supports? Sort of writing so, so, she's still, so she's writing more in Arabic, but um, it's half a page now. And then she's now attempting to write in English. And even though it's two lines, it's a victory for me. But today's entry was awesome. Where is it? It says, I wear my hijab. Um, I don't know with what that's like clothes. with my Islamic clothes, which makes me glamorous. And I was just like, yes, you are glamorous. <laughs> Tip three, based on her observations, Ms. Chapman Santiago creates scaffolds that draw on students' home language practices. Students who are literate in home languages benefit from translated copies of texts and prompts like this exit slip. While students complete this assignment, they can talk to a partner using whatever language they'd like to ensure they understand what's being asked of them. In the end, they must answer the question in English so Ms. Chapman can see how they progress on specific language objectives. You know, Google Translate is always open. And then where I can, I have students also help. Um, and I'll send things home to like older sisters or mom, you know, parents um, for feedback. And it's just right. And, but it is a challenge. I'm not going to lie. It's a lot of work. But it's necessary if you want everybody to succeed. To recap, Ms. Chapman Santiago uses clues beyond language to help her understand her students. She makes careful inferences from students' home language practices, even if she doesn't always understand what they say or write. Ms. Chapman Santiago welcomes all kinds of language expression in her class and provides resources in home languages to students who she knows will benefit from them. 
Ms. Chapman Santiago demonstrates you can teach bilinguals even if you're not one. Join us next time. So, so really quickly, just to uh, walk through these three strands when, when seen through the lens of this video, and by the way, that's only one of five videos that are part of this web series, uh, Teaching Bilinguals Even If You're Not One, so I, I really encourage you to check those out. Um, we certainly see evidence of Ms. Chapman Santiago's stance, right? We see the importance of her um, building relationships with her bilingual students. We see the importance of using students' home languages juntos or together with English. Um, we see her translanguaging design or elements of that design. She gives students opportunities to show what they know in their home languages and in English. She uses home language performances to inform differentiated instruction and scaffolding, even if she doesn't understand students' home languages. And some shifts that she makes, right? She looks at her students' cues during a lesson and makes shifts based on those cues. She has translanguaging, uh, translation apps. Um, not only are they open all of the time to her students, but she uses them to have conversations with students about their lives. And she makes inferences based on students' work, even again, if she doesn't understand what that work says, right? So you see here how these three strands, all of these elements of Ms. Chapman Santiago's pedagogy are woven together to create this highly supportive, highly multilingual English learning space. So I wanna walk you through a few more examples now from different kinds of English spaces so you can get a few different views of what this can look like. Um, so this is a, a poetry activity. You know, I saw someone put in the chat is translanguaging only for young children. Um, not at all, right? So you saw Miss Chapman Santiago's classroom was middle school students. This example I'm going to show you is high school. Um, so in the States, that's, you know, 14 to 18 year olds, more or less. And um, I actually write about this poetry activity in an, a recent article that was published in the Journal of Language, Identity and Education. I include the citation down there if you're interested. Um, so, so this comes out of my research in Miss Winter's English language arts classroom in New York City. Um, so Miss Winter is an 11th grade ELA teacher. And though she's white and she identifies as monolingual, she's committed to continually growing um, what she would call an anti-racist translanguaging stance and related language and literacy designs. Um, so all of Miss Winter's students are students of color, almost all of whom identify as Black and Latinx, and many um, are emergent bilinguals in the classroom. So she works with an ESL teacher who also pushes into the space with her. Her pedagogy centered her students' language practices, both bilingual practices and their various ways of using their Englishes. Um, and when we worked together, I was in Miss Winter's classroom from 2015 to 2016. Together, we sort of built a year long translanguaging design over the course of a, of a year of English language arts. And Miss Winter really honed her translanguaging stance. So in this poetry activity, which occurred during that year of instruction, Miss Winter first showed students a video of the poet um, you can see a screenshot here, Melissa Lozada Oliva, performing a spoken word poem entitled My Spanish. And here I just included a, a little excerpt from that poem, which really served as a model for what would become students' own poems about their languages and their complex feelings about and sophisticated understandings of those languages. And here are just a, a few excerpts of those poems. I just love them. Uh, my English is good enough, yet mi inglés a veces se cambia. It's okay, you'll get the idea. No es muy complicado. Understand? No? Okay, doesn't matter. Uh, my English has styles from all over the world. My English can adapt to where it's at. My English is as smart as a scientist. My English changes every day. It's alive just as you're alive. It grows like an infant. It has a temper like a teenager. And last one, my English can dance, dance bachata with Spanish. My English is all over the place, bouncing off the walls. There are different versions to my English. 
Um, so what I think you see here, sort of similar to that, that TikTok video I started with is not only students' amazing translingual composition practices in these poems, but also their translingual sensibilities, their pride in their language practices that don't align with standard quote or native quote language ideals, their transgression of monolingual norms through their languaging, their love of their languaging and connections to their cultures. And all of this came about through a powerful translanguaging design, which made space for students to share parts of themselves that are so rarely invited into English spaces. And um, one, more, one more design I wanna show you here, um, and then I will wrap up so we can have some time for, for Q and A. Um, this is, uh, comes from uh, a TESOL learning space with a teacher that we profile in our book, The Translanguaging Classroom. And this is um, a unit plan from a middle school ESL or TESOL teacher who pushes into math and science classrooms. This is from Justin. The students that Justin works with in his school in California are highly linguistically and culturally diverse. And though Justin only speaks um, English and some Mandarin, he does not speak many of the home languages of his students. So in the book, um, we detail, uh, we talk in detail about a geometry unit that Justin co-designed with a math teacher. And here um, I just have a little excerpt of that unit. And I'll go over some of the important elements of this translanguaging design that leveraged students translanguaging for powerful content and language learning. So first you'll see here some essential questions uh, that guided the unit. These related to the content and also made space for students bilingual, bicultural ways of knowing. So it made space for them to share, for example, how things are measured in their homes and communities and why geometry is important there. Um, there were also well-designed um, content objectives that aligned with language objectives that were broken down into two categories, general linguistic and language specific objectives. Justin worked with the math teacher to design instruction that emerged from his stance, which included the belief that content and language had to be taught and assessed separately in order to really know what students knew and also that students had to be assessed on what they could do when using all of their language practices, their general linguistic proficiency, and when they use the language of the classroom, that was English. So that their language specific performances in English. Um, another way that Justin's stance showed up in his planning was through the addition of translanguaging objectives in his lesson and unit planning. So here you can see, um, in addition to the general linguistic and language specific objectives, he thought about how explicitly he could plan for and invite students to use their bilingualism, cultural knowledge and translingual sensibilities to do exciting, innovative things with geometry. Um, and I'll just read some of the objectives here, right? So we have students will recognize and track math vocabulary cognates. Students will explain their language choices in oral presentations. Um, students will work in groups to solve math problems using both English and their home languages, right? So translanguaging objectives in addition to content and language objectives, which, which we often see. And lastly, Justin and his co-teacher designed an action-oriented culminating project. And I'll really quickly just read the description here. In groups, students create bilingual children's books that explain a geometric concept using English and an additional language, as well as culturally relevant examples and connections. Students present their books to elementary school teachers and later read them to groups of elementary school students with whom they share a home language. Students are assessed on their understanding of math content, as well as their creativity and strategic use of both languages. Um, so, you know, I think here there, there is so much going on. There is so much content area literacy being fostered. And, and you see here 
it also fostered this idea that students can do more with the math content, more with English when they are invited to use their translanguaging within their learning. Um, and it's a space for students to tap into their translanguaging action oriented and affirming ways. So um, I do have one more example, but I'm going to skip it so that we have a little more time, but it is one of the other wonderful teachers that we uh, uh, show on the CUNY NYSEB website. Her name is Michelle Demarukis, and she is an, a TESOL teacher in New York City as well. And she's one of the teacher leaders in the project. So on the website, um, which I will put in the chat after this uh, presentation, we feature people in the pro who worked with the project who really ran with this idea of translanguaging. And Michelle is one of those teachers who um, really took a translanguaging approach to project-based learning and writing. So I'll, I'll show you that page briefly after the, after the presentation, um, but I'll now move forward to um, sort of thinking a little bit about first steps, right? You've seen what translanguaging is, why it's important and how teachers I've worked with have leveraged it in their approaches to pedagogy. Um, but you might be wondering, okay, well, what, what, what do I do? What are my own first steps? Um, and maybe if you're already doing some of this work, how can you extend those first steps? So um, first, fostering a translanguaging stance starts with knowing ourselves and our internalized understandings of language. It also means disrupting those internalized understandings as we engage in personal learning. And there are, are lots of ways that you can do that kind of personal learning. You can engage in scholarly reading. You can follow critical social media. Uh, you could follow that bilingual hashtag on TikTok. You can watch movies and TV, listen to podcasts, read literature, all of which is ideally written and created from the points of view of bilingual people and communities and that challenge normative notions about language and speakers. And of course, that personal learning will hopefully be extended and continue as we communicate our stances to and learn from our students and colleagues in our individual contexts. You can also, like the teachers you saw today, make space for translanguaging within the programmatic language structures of schools, right? So often there is this singular emphasis on English in many TESOL programs, but even just making clear to students that they never have to, quote, turn off their other language or leave a language at the door, um, that in fact using all of their linguistic resources can only help them to learn these new features, integrate these new features into their repertoire, that's a powerful message that we can, that we can communicate. Um, you might supplement your existing curriculum with texts that are culturally sustaining and normalize translanguaging and bilingualism, right? You could find bilingual writers or writers who share a linguistic and cultural background with your students. You could include multimodal texts like social media and music and videos that illustrate translanguaging and translingual composition. You could even show that TikTok to your students, have them make their own tell me you're bilingual without telling me you're bilingual videos. Um, in general, I think the more engaged students are with the content, the closer to the surface, the translanguaging corriente can flow. And lastly, um, you can start to create translanguaging classroom designs that actively and purposefully leverage students' bilingualism and encourage translanguaging. And I hope, and hopefully the designs that you saw today um, in today's webinar give you some ideas. And of course, I hope that you'll take a look at the Translanguaging Classroom book and some of the other resources on the CUNY NYSEB website for even more ideas. Um, so I really want to thank Anna for inviting me. Thank all of you for being here from so many different places across the world. Uh, I'm really interested in hearing your questions, hearing your thoughts. So I We'll end there. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Kate, so much for that. Um, I, I certainly learned a lot. So as Kate said, we have some time for questions. All right, so um, you can either put it in the chat or if you'd like, go ahead and raise your hand and you know I can call on you. Um, 
Yes, but first of all, let's give Kata a round of applause. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. A round of applause. All right, so thank you. Um, are there any questions? Let me look in the chat here. Okay. And I'm just gonna go ahead and put the, oops, I did it in a direct message because somebody direct messaged me. Hold on. <laughs> it, go, it like always defaults to that, doesn't it? Okay, hold on. Yeah. There's the, the CUNY NICE website um, for those of you who want to check it out. Okay, um, there's a question here from Katie Welch. All right, it's in the chat. Uh, thanks for a great talk, Kate. I think of a time I was training in service uh, adult TESOL teachers and tried to debunk the myth that a student's home language has no place in the TESOL classroom. You could audibly hear the room collectively gasp at the suggestion that home languages are an asset. Given that pedagogy flows from teacher's stance, how can we as teacher educators challenge and shape existing teacher stances that are contrary to trans languaging? Um, thank you so much, Katie, for, for the great question. Um, I, I think you can hear an audible gasp in a lot of spaces, right? Traditional spaces, because these ideologies about linguistic separation in order to teach English in particular are rampant, right? They're, they're everywhere. It is baked in particularly to, to TESOL instruction. So I think the more that we can get teachers talking about how we ourselves language, right? Think, you know, thinking about if these teachers are bilingual themselves, what does the conversation around the dinner table sound like in your home, right? What did it sound like um, when you went out to a wedding, you know, with, with friends and family? What, what does the music sound like? What language is the music in? What language are conversations happening in? Really pointing out just how these rigid separations of language are very much part of classrooms, not parts of families and communities. So I think the more we can sort of point to just how different language and how much less rigid, how much more um, uh, flexible, playful, um, you know, and, and, uh, and multimodal, right? Our languaging is outside of schools. Um, the more we can start chipping away at these ideologies that inform that gasp right? Because what that gasp means is someone has introduced something that goes against our ideological common sense, right? And I think part of the process of disrupting ideological common sense is to shine light on it, right? So you say that students shouldn't use their home languages. How did you plan this lesson today, right? I mean, thinking, really getting teachers to think about their own practices um, and seeing the, the diversity of their own language practices can be one way of shaping that stance in teachers who might be contrary to it. All right, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna go through the questions in the chat. And um, there is a question from Kathleen Stuckey. Um, how does the idea of inner language intersect with translanguaging? I know that's a common question that gets raised a lot. Okay, let me just have some. Yeah. How does the idea of interlanguage intersect with translanguaging? So I think when we when we think about translanguaging, um, translanguaging is almost a, a getting back to ideologies that are outside, you know, getting away from ideologies that are affiliated with like a monolingual gaze, right? Or a monolingual perception. And so I think terms like interlanguage, like code switching, um, like so many of the, of the structures that are a part of the linguistics um, per profession, right? And TESOL profession is to say, you know, that these are, these are inventions, right? That have been created, terms that have been created through a monolingual lens on the languaging of bilingual people. And so I think translanguaging as theory would say that the ways that bilingual people, the ways that multilingual societies, communities have always languaged does not align with the norms that we teach and uphold through these professions and through these, these um, terms, 
right? So I would say that translanguaging is a lens that can be applied to all languaging and to even terms that are, are, are um, aligned with some of those monoglossic ideologies like interlanguage. Hey, um, there's a question uh, uh, related to Kate Welch's question. Um, how do you address students' reluctance to embrace a translanguaging environment? Right? For example, students who have internalized the perfect attainment view of English proficiency, and so they're actually quite reluctant to even use their home language in the classroom. Yeah, um, it's such an important question, and, and it's one I get a lot, and I think, you know, we definitely would never say, <laughs> we don't need one more thing to be prescriptive about with students, right? You must engage in translanguaging, right? No, um, we would never want to tell students how to use their languaging. Um, but I think, you know, particularly for older students, and those are the students that I've worked with, right? Usually high school students. And I gave you examples today of, of older students. That's a lot of years, especially if they've had a lot of time in the US, a lot of years of schooling that have communicated to them that their home languages are not important to their learning. And so I think, you know, that reluctance is very much um, often tied to self-protection, um, to, you know, I've been told my whole schooling career that I can't do this and now you're telling me to do this, right? It's understandable that there would be some reluctance. So I think the more we invite, the more we make space, the more we actively leverage and, and ask students to talk about their languaging, um, the less reluctance there might be, right? But if a student wants to use English only in the classroom, that is their right. What I think is important then is also communicating that if you are bilingual, if you are multilingual, nothing you do will ever just be in English. Everything you do will be multilingual because you are multilingual. So even if something you write for me is in English, the process that you went through to create it was translingual in nature because our languages are not separated, right? They're interconnected and inform one another. So I think even these kinds of things that we can communicate to students are powerful and set up the opportunity for students to, to lower their reluctance a little and share. Um, from a Ava, um, she says, thank you for your great talk. Could you tell us or explain how is translation defined or seen through the translanguaging lens? From the translation theory perspective, there's nothing like a translation. There are different ways. Do you use communicative translation or literal translation? So how does it work with translation theory? I will readily admit that this is not my area of expertise. Um, I don't know translation theory very well. Um, what I will say is that often teachers will say, oh, I engage in translanguaging because I'm translating, right? I'm translating a text or I'm translating a prompt. And while that is helpful, I think you can still uphold many monoglossic ideologies while providing translations of student, uh, to students. So I think um, they can be entry points to help students by giving them translations. But I think translanguaging um, as an approach to pedagogy would say that you have to do more, right? You have to invite students translanguaging. Um, through their own meaning making, right? And, and maybe it's comparing a translated text and a text in English, getting them to think metalinguistically across those texts, right? These are the kinds of activities that move students past simply reading you know, a text in English, a text in another language um, and integrating their language practices for their learning. So I'm sorry that I can't say more about translation theory, but I'm sure there are others who could, who could provide insight. Um, I'm sorry, I skipped a question that was um, asked earlier um, from Padmini. Um, it's related to literacy. So what other means of enabling students' languaging knowledge systems are there for students that can't write in their other language systems? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and this sort of relates to Yashad's question about um, special factors to be taken with translanguaging at the elementary level, right? I think, which is that 
you know, many, especially young children, are emergent writers and readers, not just in their in English, but in their home language as well. So I think the more we can create opportunities for oral language, right, for students to turn and talk to one another about a new topic before learning something in English, right? You're sitting next to someone who speaks your home language, talk about what we just learned in your home language, and then I'm gonna teach you something about it in English, right? Or play, right? I think particularly with young children, encouraging play that is multilingual around the content area topics that are being taught in class um, is wonderful. And we've done some work with CUNY NICEB on on translanguaging and play-based learning, which I think is, is something that can really, um, you know, bring students translanguaging to the surface and then be leveraged in ways that are, you know, great for students who are pre-literate, um, pre-written and, and um, text-based literacies. So I think, you know, in general, the more we can leverage students' oral languaging, the more we can read to them if we, if we share home language practice with students, um, the more we can get students talking, thinking out loud, and then translate some of those understandings into, into writing. Mm. Well, that, that, that's interesting to think about actually. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so, all right, it's about time now and um, I wanna keep it to time. So I just, just want to thank you once again, Kate. Um, it, I, I just have one announcement to make. Um, so first of all, um, for those of you who were registered in this, um, everyone will be receiving actually a video um, of this presentation. All right. So even if you aren't able to make it, um, you are. Um, you will receive a video uh, of it. So if you, any of your colleagues or friends who have registered and somehow missed it because of the time difference, that's possible. Right. Um, one more announcement. I'd like to share actually um, is that she is the first in our webinar series too. We have two more coming up, Dr. Angelica Galante and Dr. Laila Hai. Um, they will be um, looking more at translanguaging in um, higher educational spaces. So how teachers are responding to translanguaging in higher ed and in IEPs. Um, I intentionally chose those two because that seems to be a discussion that um, I don't know much about. And so I'd like to know more about it. And I think there is a space for translanguaging in higher ed, but I'm personally, I'm not sure how that space works, to be honest. Um, so I actually want to explore that. And I'd like to invite you to explore that with me as well, too, because um, I do think there is a space for translanguaging. All right. So thank you so much, everyone. And um, thank you once again, Kate.